I would prefer doing business in the US rather in Canada. What's the highest ticket product or service that I can find in Dubai that I can capitalize on? Real estate. But then there's a lot of competition. It's Dollars. crazy. Agents yeah. can make a lot of money. So if they're closing a property for a million dirhams, they're actually making about 25,000 yeah. dirhams. Success is 80% mindset. Build, delegate, automate, repeat. Even if you're not getting a lot of views, you're just building up your business card. People who are trying to create content to get views are the people who end up quitting after a week. Because yeah. During the, the summer, people leave. There's not as many tourists in Dubai. How do you manage this? Ah, <sighs> Jesus Christ. Hello everyone, my name is Bergthor Paulsen. I'm here with uh, Noah Merby. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, man. All right, so before we uh, get into uh, each other's stories, uh, I wanted to give uh, just a brief uh, introduction of myself and, and you also. So I am, uh, I'm from Iceland. I have a like property management company there and I do Airbnb arbitrage here in Dubai. Moved here six months ago, do subleasing. That's where I rent Airbnb apartments for long term, put them on Airbnb and try to make a profit. You on the other hand, you're a digital marketing specialist, author of three books and uh, 250,000 students that have bought your courses and a lot more. Yes, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, it's just a lot of work. I think I isolated myself from people for about five years and I just worked a lot, yeah. a lot of different things. Uh, I, I wasn't focused. I was really distracted by a lot of different things. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So so before we like get into the details, like where are you from? You, you told me you were from Canada, right? Yes. Uh, originally, so my parents are from Lebanon. Okay. I moved to, I was raised in Lebanon and I lived there till I was about um, 19. Hmm. I moved to Canada. So I was doing, I did a year and a half of law school in Lebanon, and then I moved to Canada. I did three years of marketing. I did a half a year of psychology, half a year of anthropology, and I had a semester to graduate, and then I quit university, and I started working in business full-time, mm -hmm. and uh, lived in Canada for almost eight years, and a month ago, I moved to Dubai, and here we are. Nice. So, so you moved on your own to Canada? from Lebanon, yes. or was it not with your family or anything like that? Uh, well, my family came for the first week, yeah. uh, but pretty much they put me in an Airbnb uh, nice. for the next two days. My yeah. dad gave me maybe $1,500 yeah. and they're like, okay, you need to figure out a job, university, yeah. cooking, housing, yada, yada, yada. And I came from a background where, uh, you know, I had my car in Lebanon, I had an apartment, I was just living life a lot more comfortably. Mm. And I was just thrown into the real world at a relatively young age and I had to figure everything out, which was a really good experience. I would say yeah. it wasn't easy, but it was why did you start, decide to go to Canada? Uh, my brother was a lawyer there for like 15 years. Okay. So it was the first thing that I thought about if I wanted to go anywhere, it would make sense to go where my brother is. But he lived in Toronto, which is a five hour drive for me or mm. a six hour bus ride. Mm. And rarely do we ever get the chance to meet each other. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Life. So before you got into digital marketing, did you have like a normal job there or? I worked at Foot Locker okay. when I was 20 years old for six yeah. months and I saved up money for six months and I started my Amazon FBA business. That was the first uh, success that I had in business. Okay. I started an Amazon FBA business. I got Funko Pop toys. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're like little bubble head toys that I found at Walmart. Mm. They were selling for 25 bucks at Walmart. They were selling on Amazon for about 69. Nice. I bought all of them, sold them, made about $1,500 in two weeks, wow. reinvested all of this into products from China, didn't sell any of those products, had them shipped back from Amazon, thrown in the trash, and then I was in a limbo. Oh, but okay. that's what I was doing. I was working kind of in retail yeah, sales. So that was the first, first entrepreneur thing entrepreneur you ever did. Venture. And was the next thing you got into digital marketing or? Yes, I started a digital marketing agency, Yeah, not having a lot of experience. I would work with clients for free for the first month. Mm. That was uh, six years ago. So I'll work with them for free for the first month. And I'm like, okay, if you like guys like the results and you'd like to work more, then we can talk about a contract. Okay. And I was able to land three clients this way, yeah. literally cold, cold emails, met with them. Uh, they were all restaurant owners. Um, did a month of work for free. They liked the work. Then we signed a contract and I worked with them for a little while, but then the margins were not that great. Uh, clients, they complain a lot. They want to do so much and want to pay so little. Yeah. And it was a competitive market. There's a lot of big digital marketing companies that were taking all the clients. So I had to kind of figure out my situation there. Yeah. But, uh, what about you? So where did you start? 
Well, um, so obviously I'm from Iceland. I started uh, managing Airbnb apartments there and uh, grew that business to 25 apartments, about 30 apartments now. Amazing. And uh, just Iceland is not very scalable. You can't get like very big. So I wanted to go somewhere else and Dubai was the choice. And now I'm here. I have four apartments that I've uh, already subleased Amazing. and growing that, trying to grow that to uh, 100. That's the goal in the so next year or two. What, what makes Iceland difficult and what makes Dubai a better choice? So the reason, so Iceland is actually great f for a lot of things, but the biggest difficulty is that it's so small. There's mm -hmm. only, there's less than 400,000 people that live in Iceland. Really? And uh, so to get, uh, apartments to manage it takes a long time mm -hmm. like you have you have to spend weeks to just to get one apartment but here in dubai i could get 10 apartments in one week or just as fast as i want it you know it's just as long as i'm ready for it mm -hmm. so so it's really just the scalability here in dubai that's uh, so interesting people. yeah more people and you could just grow and grow and grow and everything's so much faster and yeah there's just a lot of reasons Oh, for, for uh, why why Dubai? What's the and choice? what's what's the vision? What's the vision? Probably right now, just to grow uh, to about at least 40, 50 apartments. So that's where I'm. I, I I like rent apartments for a full year, put them on Airbnb, make a make profit on the difference, grow that to like 40, 50 apartments, get all the systems correct, and then just see where it goes. Maybe. I decide to start doing something else, buying properties, or maybe I'll just keep going. Maybe, maybe I'll start like a management uh, company. company where I just manage apartments for other people and don't sublease them. I just manage them and take a percentage of the revenue, maybe. But uh, yeah, I just have like a little bit of a vision for the next few months to a year or two, and then we'll just see where it goes. And what do you think potentiality wise? So mm -hmm. in Dubai, uh, you did 25, 30 apartments in Iceland. Yeah. And then you're like, okay, Dubai is the move. Obviously, Dubai has more people. Yeah. There's a lot more tourists. And yeah. the profit margins that you can get in Dubai are obviously better. They're actually not better. Really? They're, they're probably similar, but if anything, a little bit worse. But, really? But, but the thing is here, you can just, I think you can just automate make things a little better. Because obviously you can hire people into your role a lot cheaper than in Iceland. And like I mentioned earlier, you just, can just get so many apartments so fast. Uh, yeah. So. so Dubai, in terms of scalability, it's easier because there is more apartments. There is easier opportunity to scale. Yeah. But in terms of profit margins, it's not as good. But what's... What's the reason? Is it because there's a lot of competition? Pro yeah, it's definitely a competition. competition. Yeah, there's just so many managers here. Yeah. Everybody's managing Airbnb apartments. apartments yeah, Airbnbs. so many Airbnbs. Not so as many, many hotels. Iceland. No, there's less. Definitely less. Which and, and Iceland is actually very big on tourism. There's a lot of tourists there. Um, yeah, so that's the reason. And it's really just the competition with everything is so much higher in Dubai. It's just like the cl cleaning just like cleaning company I have at home, they're just like nothing compared to the cleaning company here. Like the cleaning company here, here, just everything is perfect. And and just like delivery, you get food to your home, just you name it, anything. The standard is just so much higher on everything here. So it's like the best people at everything all around the world decided yeah. to congregate in Dubai and yeah, just yeah. turn the city into something uh, yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah, 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 definitely. It's crazy. So four apartments right now. What's your timeline to get to 40, 50? You think you would achieve it within a year? Yeah. Um, so I want to get to that like before next summer. Before, before next yeah, summer. Yeah, I think so. And then I'll probably go back to Iceland over the summer. Uh, Expand a little more. Well, I don't think I'm going to be expanding um, a lot more in Iceland. I'm just going to be focusing on Dubai, I think. 30. But I just want to be like, obviously, Dubai is hot in the summer. Iceland's pretty nice in the summer. I want to stay in Iceland. <laughs> you for already the summer. experienced one summer here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I came here in the summer. I've, I pretty much, I've only been here six months. So I came here in the heat. Now it's starting to cool down a little bit. So I've pretty much only experienced Dubai in, in the summer. <laughs> but let's go back to you for a little bit. Uh, yes. So, so. The thing you're doing, is it the same as what I keep hearing, SMMA? 
I keep SMMA. hearing this. Yeah, is that the same? I don't do SMMA. No. Nah. What, what's the difference between that to SMMA is social media and marketing agency. Okay. Uh, when people do SMMA, they do social media management, they do websites, they do SEO, they do all of that stuff. And these are things that are time consuming. Mm. SEO is very time consuming. Websites are very time consuming. All of these things, social media is very time consuming. For me, when I started gaining my experience in marketing, I wasn't just, I didn't just want to focus on the money. I also wanted to focus on time because time is money. So I'm like, I can work with a client who pays me $5,000, but I have to spend 40 hours a week working for them. Yeah. Does that make any sense? Yeah. No, it doesn't. So I started focusing on something called lead generation. So all I do in marketing right now, even though I know how to do websites, I know how to do CRM systems, SEO, all of that, I've already done that, but they are time consuming. So I focus on lead generation. I have companies that I work with, for example, let's say a car dealership. They want more leads, people who are looking to buy cars. I run an ad. There are companies that I'm working with right now. I literally ran an ad six months ago. Six months ago. I did not touch it ever since. And it keeps bringing in leads every day. I don't do anything. Mm -hmm. Leads come in, they go to the company, they sell leads, they pay, and then repeat, repeat, repeat. So what I focus on in marketing is lead generation in different uh, industries, basically. Mm -hmm. So you don't manage their Instagram accounts. You just put up advertisement, bring them leads. And do you like... How do you charge them? Do you, charge, do you just have a contract? Either, so there's always an onboarding fee. People pay an onboarding fee to begin with. And then they have charge per lead. So every lead that they get, there are two types of lead. There's something called a paper lead, which is name, email, phone number, and a city. And that's like just somebody who's interested. And then there's a qualified lead. Uh, same information, name, email, city, phone number, but also budget for the car. What kind of car? Sports car, SUV, uh, what kind of brand of car you're looking for? Uh, how long you've been employed? How much is your salary? This is a full application. This is called a qualified lead. So those are priced differently, but I usually just charge an onboarding fee for me to begin with, study the market, run, run the odds, and then I charge them per paper lead and per qualified lead. Mm. And that's it. Mm. Makes life so easy. Um, doesn't, doesn't take a lot of time. You run an ad, maybe you optimize it every weekend, but that's pretty much it. So did you start this in Canada? Yes. Yeah. I started working in industries such as solar industry, for example, was one of the best industries. Solar was booming. And I started working in solar industry, for example, mm -hmm. um, car dealers, uh, car loans are yeah. one of the best industries you can get into because it's very easy to get people who are interested yeah. and using uh, faith, Facebook and Google algorithms. It's very easy to find the people that you want to find. Mm -hmm. So I started there and now slowly shifting that into here. Nice. And how many clients do you have right now? Right now, about six. Okay. But even though I have the opportunity to expand into more people, I don't because the six people that I work with are people that I worked with for a long time. Yeah. One thing that I hate about B2B businesses is clients can be a pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. and that's something that maybe you running the Airbnb business, you're going to notice that sometimes tenants are very picky about I'm not sure. I've never ran such a business fully, yeah. so I don't know exactly. But I know in marketing, for example, uh, let's say I get leads to a car dealership. Their sales guys, they have a great week. They close $10,000 in commission worth of sales. They make a big paycheck. Then next week, they're complacent. Mm -hmm. They're comfortable. They made their money. So then they don't perform as well. Their boss comes. What's happening? They say, oh, the lead quality wasn't as good this week. Yeah. But you didn't do anything different. So I'm like, I'm still running the same odds. Nothing different is happening on my end. So this thing gets, becomes a pain in the ass. So eventually I'm like, okay, for me, it's more about peace of mind. Six clients, they pay enough for me to have a certain lifestyle along with other things. I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, now let me focus on other stuff. You know what I mean? So doing that six clients, I don't know if I would expand. It would depend on the client and the size of the business. But I think that's a pretty good uh, margin for people to focus yeah. on. Yeah. One thing that uh, resonated with me, what you said is uh, that uh, clients are a lot of work. So, oh, yeah. so the reason uh, in Airbnb, there's like two, two uh, uh, models. You okay. can either sublease or you can manage for other people. And if you're managing for other people, then the owners are obviously taking a big chunk of the money and they, they're going to be bugging you about every single thing. They're going to be saying the photos are not good. The furniture is not good. This is not good. You're going to change this, change that, change that. And imagine if you're managing 40 apartments for 40 different <laughs> owners, it's just a lot of work. But if you're subleasing them, then you just pay them a specific amount Every and you month. don't, and they don't care because they just get a fixed amount and they're not going to bug, bug you. They, they don't want to be bugged. The, the, so, so that's why I focus on subleasing rather than management. So I resonated with that a lot. Oh yeah. So, so tell me, uh, the six clients are obviously in Canada. Mm -hmm. Are you trying to get clients now in Dubai or are you just live, you just live here for, for 
I'm not lifestyle. trying to get clients in Dubai. Okay. I actually recently started working on a brokerage and investment company in Dubai. Nice. So part of all this experience that's been accumulating, I'm like, okay, real estate is obviously big in Dubai. Um, for me, it's when I came to Dubai, I'm like, okay, I'm an expert in marketing. Mm-hmm. I'm an expert in sales. Yeah. What's the highest ticket product or service that I can find in Dubai that I can capitalize on? Obviously, first day I found the answer, real estate. Mm. Real estate is the most profitable thing you can get into in Dubai. On the contrast, there's a lot of competition. Mm. Competition is crazy. But at the same time, when you acquire a certain set of skills, I looked at the competition. I looked at the people operating. There are some great real estate companies here. But majority of people, they come here and they start a real estate company thinking that they can make it work without any prior experience or knowledge. Now, having a lot of experience from Canada and bringing it into this, uh, the focus here is going to be the brokerage and investment company as a next step. I think all the experience that I gained is going to help elevate that. And this is why I was really interested in Airbnb, because when I first came here, um, one of the first things that I thought about is subleasing. But then the hassle was finding clients or finding companies that would allow you to do that. And I spoke to a bunch and they all said they're not open to it. So I think that's something that you mentioned in one of your videos is that it really takes time to find a company that would allow you to do the Mm subleasing. But then I did more research and I'm like, okay, this comes with its own headaches of you need to renovate the apartment and all that. And and one thing, it's a concern, also a question that I have for you. You came here during the summer, which is a low season. I'm like, okay, I can get an apartment. I can do subleasing. And for six months, it's going to do really well. But then during the, the summer, people leave and there's not as many tourists in Dubai. How do you manage this? How do you have, so have you been through this? So so when I came to Dubai, I uh, started working with uh, brokerage and uh, a lead uh, uh, vacation home company. management company. Started working with them. Uh, I uh, The plan was to work for them long term and just build uh, everything with them. Uh, but then I just kind of decided to go into my own direction. So, so I went through the summer with uh, their properties and saw how everything was. And I, I knew that summers were very, uh, that's definitely a very low season in Dubai. But the thing is, if you present your properties correctly, if you just have nice photos, you do everything correctly, you, you just, you're just going to have to set the property at a right price and you're going to get booked. During I'm, I'm going to be able to be at least 80% occupied in the summer. Obviously, just the price is just going to be a lot lower. lower. But when I estimate my uh the the revenue of an, an apartment i i take the summers into account that obviously the summers are going to be a lot lower uh but i i was in dubai f- for the whole summer i watched how 20 30 properties were running with this uh company that i worked for and i i could see that that if we just present them correctly if we have the price low enough we're going to get booked so yeah so this is actually very interesting because the prices during the summer are a lot lower, but mm-hmm. are they enough to make you break even at least on that given month? Um, or do you even make profits maybe during the probably summer? Probably not profits, but you're going to break even or maybe lose a little bit during the summer But you months. compensate during yeah, the winter months. exactly. And okay. the summer months are only three months and you have so many other good months in, in Dubai. You know what I mean? What about compared to Iceland? In Iceland, you only have three or four peak months and the rest are just off, off season. Okay, but do you but, get bookings during off season as well? Absolutely, people people come to Iceland the whole whole uh, all year. In the summer, it's just weather's great. In the winter, you see the northern lights and stuff like that. But there's definitely a big difference between the summer and winter. Um, yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the thing that I was the main concern was like, okay, prices of real estate during the summer are a lot lower. I I assume even sales in real estate are a lot lower. Yeah. So this is a way for you to compensate is that you would make, let's say, I don't know two, three times what you're paying during winter months so that you compensate for break-evens during yeah, summers. Absolutely. Okay. And do you think that there is, would you think about any, for example, creative ways that you can actually boost revenue during summer for mm-hmm. you to go above break-even and maybe make a little bit of profit? Or do you think it's always going to be saturated during summer to break-even? Um, that's something I, uh, I just have to try out next summer. But one thing that I know some people are doing is, uh, putting the apartments not on Airbnb, but just on property finder, trying to find a little, yeah, try try to find a little long-term, more long-term tenants in Mm -hmm, in the summertime, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. somebody that can stay for a month, two or three. Uh, but yeah, just the summers are always going to be, be less, 
you're gonna make a lot less in the summer. But what about uh, you say you're starting? You say you were starting a property brokerage on investment property brokerage. So, so a property brokerage, you're starting a company that just sells apartments and rents apartments for e, people. Not rents, sells. Just uh, selling. So, I started building connections within developers, and yeah. I would just take early projects that the developers are working on, mm-hmm. and I would run ads in different countries. I would get leads. This is what I do for a living. I mm-hmm. get leads who are interested in buying properties. I would get on the phone. And then I would train sales guys to get on the phone with these people and basically sell them on an investment property mm. uh, with a certain capital appreciation, with certain return on investment, close them on the property. In terms of a brokerage company, you would earn 5% of the total price of the property. Yeah. Um, so if you have a uh, an agent that works with you, a sales guy, they will usually get 2 to 2.5%, which is quite a bit. So if they're mm-hmm. closing a property for a million dirhams, they're actually making about Twenty five thousand yeah, dollars. Crazy agents yeah. can make a lot of money. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And you're making you're making that per deal. So I'm imagining, I'm somebody who want, who likes to do things hands on. So as much as I like my time to be for myself, because I want to invest this in the right places. If I can be on the phone and close clients myself and make five percent instead of just having agents call and me making two to two point five percent, I would do that. I would get agents to do the calls while I'm also making calls because five percent. The average property sale here is going to be around a million. Some properties sell for as much as 10 million, 20, dirhams, 50, right? 60. It's, yeah. yeah, million dirhams. It's still quite a bit of money. So you're basically just, uh, th- these are what are called off-plan apartments here in Dubai, right? 100% yeah. off-plan. So you're just uh, t- talking to developers and selling the apartments that are usually not even ready yet. They're not even and ready. Do you already have agents or are you still in just the early process? I, I have agents in mind. I have people that know me and they know that, okay, once I have something solid, I'm going to bring them in and they're going to start working. But for now, I'm building this by myself. It's still in the early stages. I'm still learning everything to it. But it's a very interesting model because you're the middleman. You just get the leads. You do the, yeah. the ads. You get the leads. You sell. And then you send the clients to the developers. And then your job is done. You yeah. earn your 50,000 dirhams and then you're done. You don't have to go again. And then this client, if they want to buy another property, because majority of, of clients that want to do investments in Dubai, they usually have room capital to invest in several properties. Once they get one property and they start seeing the capital appreciation on the property, they bought it for a million. Now it's worth 1.2. They're like, okay, this is good. They're going to call you again. Hey, what other properties, yeah. what other developers do you have in mind? I want to invest another $5 million. Mm-hmm. Then you start building a relationship. And it's a very nice work because your clients are going to come to Dubai to see their, pro- their, their projects. You're going to get a nice car. You're going to go to the airport. You're going to get your chauffeur to pick them up, take them to their hotel, then take them from the hotel, show them the properties, invite them to dinner. It's a very, um, it's a very nice field of work to get into. Mm-hmm. And you'll meet people, network. You'll network with people who are very high net worth people and people who are very high up the the social echelon. Mm -hmm. And you'll be able to get with these people to a lot of different places. So all these points just kind of made sense. And I said, okay, let's get into that. Um, But to be, to be honest, when I first came here, the first thing that I had in mind was subleasing, subleasing an Airbnb because did you ever do that in Canada? I have my business partner, Mm -hmm. um, it's a funny story. So this is a guy that I messaged six years ago and I'm like, I would work for you for free. I saw that he was pretty successful. Worked with him for free for about six months. Then we started working together. I started working for his company first and eventually we ended up as business partners in a lot of projects. And he owns um, several properties in Canada. I'm not sure exactly how many, between 15 and 20. And he was doing Airbnb. So a lot of the work, I was looking at the accounts and looking at the Airbnb and just crazy numbers, crazy figures. Mm-hmm. Uh, one issue that happened in Canada that came up eventually is that Canada said, okay, we're going to start reinforcing certain regulations where yeah. it's one Airbnb per person because the prices yeah. of rent, rent prices were going through the roof. Yeah. Now, obviously you can find ways around it. You can get more than one license. I'm not exactly sure how it works, but that created a big obstacle mm-hmm. here in Dubai. You can go get 30, 40, 50, as long as you have an agreement with the sub with the leasing company, yeah. you don't have any issues, but in Canada and a lot of different places in the world, these problems started to occur where Mm -hmm. the governments wanted to limit the amount of properties that you can put on Airbnb so they can limit the price surge for rent. And that Mm -hmm. created a lot of issues. Yeah. Um, So yeah, that's where the switch happened. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. A lot of cities in America are like cracking down on regulations. And in Dubai, there's a lot of 
like regulations you have to follow. You have to like register this, register that. It's so much more than an mainland Iceland. company. Yeah, yeah, it's so much more than uh, in an Iceland. Actually, you don't have to have a mainland company to sublease. I think you can sublease one property on on your personal name. I'm not exactly sure what that uh, what the rules are, but um, if you want to grow a company, then- yeah, exactly. So I just started a mainland company because I knew where where it was gonna go. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. So comparing the process, Iceland to Dubai, you said Dubai, the process is a little bit more complicated. Yeah, there's this, what makes it more complicated is company registration. Well, so the thing is, the big thing is just you have to, there's just a lot of more regulations you have to follow. You have to apply for this permit, then you have to apply for that permit, and then you have to apply for another permit. And then you have to register each guest into uh, this portal so that the security will let them in. Like in Iceland, you just send them the lockbox code and they go into the apartment. Take the key. Yeah, exactly. But here, there's just a lot more regulations that you, that you have to follow. One thing, tell me, so so you, you looked into this uh, arbitrage model, subleasing model here in Dubai. And what other obstacles did you uh, face? And The main obstacle was finding companies yeah. that would allow subleasing. Okay, so so I hear that a lot. So I, I recently started posting like a little video so my, on my Instagram about subleasing and that's a lot of people are saying that's the biggest problem. And that's that's actually what I think is the, the least amount of problem. Really? <laughs> yeah, because as long as you're presentable, which obviously you are presentable, uh, you just have to talk to maybe 10 agents and then you two of them will say, yeah, owner's okay with subleasing. So you just have to talk to enough agents, but obviously you have to be presentable. You have to show them that you know what you're talking about. And what I think is the biggest obstacle is in subleasing is just being profitable because so, i see there's so many people that want to do subleasing want to do subleasing but they don't have a lot of airbnb experience and airbnb is like it's a skill just like trading 100%. is a is a skill just like digital marketing is a skill like you can't just go into digital digital marketing and be successful like right away you need months of training to be Skills. to be good so so what i so I to say to people that they want to do subleasing is you just start slow, start super slow and just practice your Airbnb skills because it's a lot harder than it is. It's a lot harder than it looks just because you need to get five stars. If you're getting consistently three or four stars, then you're not going to be profitable. Mm-hmm. And there's so many other things you have to like if you have seven properties, there's it's so much work like answering all guests. You, you have to have certain system in place. You have to hire like virtual assistants to to handle management. You have to have somebody pick up the, the phone. You don't want to be answering calls in the middle in the middle of the night. So absolutely not, especially when you have 30, 40 units. Yes. So so the biggest obstacle is being profitable. So you have to anyone who wants to start this is just start slow, get one property, practice on it for months, at least four or five months, and just see that you can be profitable. Because I think most people that are going to start self leasing in Dubai, they're just going to start, and they're not going to be profitable. So so un- until you practice and you become really good, that's even though I didn't run into this issue yet yeah. because I didn't get to that stage. Of course, but this is one of the main things that I thought about. Yeah, because I'm like okay. I know how Airbnb works, probably not as good as you do, nowhere near, but I know how Airbnb operates and I understand marketing. But I'm like, there are people who've been running Airbnbs in Dubai yeah. for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years yeah. that know so much more than I do. Mm-hmm. The competition is just going to eat me out. I'm not going to be able to operate at this scale, really. Yeah. So even though I didn't run into this issue, but 100% I understand you. And I think I think the, the first part of this equation or, or this first issue is the easiest one to handle in terms of finding eventually an agent that would say yes. Mm-hmm. But then you got a property, you paid, let's say, 200,000 uh, dirhams for the full year, and now you want to recoup that plus make some profits. And that's when majority of people are going to are gonna run into issues. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But but I mean, it's definitely something you can overcome. I'm not saying it's impossible to sell lease. You just have to practice your skills. And, and Dubai may be is a hard place to do that, but definitely possible. I mean, I had the luxury of, of in starting Iceland. in Iceland where there are pretty much no uh, like professional operators on Airbnb, pretty much. It's just everyone's just, just people. So like, why, why did you get the idea of coming to one of the most competitive cities in the world yeah. and not pick another place that's like 
Iceland, where yeah. there's a lot of tourists, but there's a lot less competition. Yeah. So so the reason there's a couple of reasons, and I definitely could have find found founded a place that was more profitable, but a big part of me just wanted to go move to another country because Iceland is just so small. You just you always want to do something bigger, you know, move out of this tiny island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. So, I, and I wanted to go somewhere where people speak English, where everybody speaks English and it's the norm to speak English because I don't want to go to like Denmark and be the only guy speaking English. You know what I mean? People are having a hard time understanding everything. Well, they're going to understand, but I'm just going to have such a disadvantage over the locals 100%. that are speaking the local language. So I wanted to go to either America, Canada, UK, or Dubai. And the regulations in Dubai were just the easiest. You know, it's the easiest for me to to get a, a visa. It's the easiest, like, regulations on, on Airbnb and to register a company. Like, as long as you just do the steps, you're, you're good. Like... I don't even know how to do it in America or UK. I mean, I haven't done the research yet, but I bet it's a lot more complicated. Plus no taxes. <laughs> Plus no taxes in Dubai. That's right. And and I mean, a big part of it is just like, I was just watching so many YouTubers here and they, they just influenced me to come in here, to come here. <laughs> <laughs> because one of the main selling points is the taxes. Yeah, true. You register a company in the US, you don't have to worry about the company registration process as much as you have to worry about submitting your information to IRS, yeah. making a mistake in your taxes, yeah. because the IRS is, is obviously going to keep very close track of everything that's happening. And eventually you're going to get taxed heavily. Yeah. All the money that you're making, if you make the same profits that you're making here, you make them in the US, mm -hmm. you're going to be way less profitable just because you have 20, 30% that has to go into taxes. Yeah, exactly. So that's also a big advantage for Dubai. Canada is taxed pretty heavily, right? Oh, Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can get up to 55.4% taxes yeah. plus a 13% wow. sales tax. That's crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So people who are earning, let's say, um, $250,000 in Canada or $200,000 in Canada, which is considered a very good salary, they earn maybe 90 k out of that, which yeah. is still good money. I'm not yeah. saying it's not, but, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's not as good as, yeah, on paper, I earn 200 k but realistically, I'm earn only earning 90 k Yeah. Uh, so exactly. this is a gap. Obviously, it comes with benefits. Uh, the government mm -hmm. takes care of schools. They take care of hospitals, stuff yeah. like that. Um, but it's pros and cons. For example, here I can get an insurance. I can get one of the best insurance for, let's say, uh, 10,000 dirhams a year. And then I'm covered. I don't need anything else. Uh, schools here are expensive. But it's, mm -hmm. it's just pros and cons everywhere. Yeah, you know? exactly. Uh, did you look into any other countries before you decided Dubai? Or were you pretty much set on Dubai? I mean, pretty much just America. Because yeah. I just follow so many people on Instagram and listen to so many podcasts from there. Like, I just learned so much from operators in America. So, so I kind of also like in the future, like two, three, four years from now, kind of have my eye on maybe doing something uh, there as well. Because, uh, yeah, it's I've just been in. Obviously, I lived in America too. I lived in California for one year. I went on exchange when I was seventeen. So. I played American football for nice. a lot. So like my heart is uh, a lot with uh, America. And yeah. Really interested in that. But yeah, that's the only country really I looked at. And plus it's one of the biggest economies. Exactly. In the world. So, yeah. um, plus networking. There's a lot of benefits mm. to the US. I would say I would prefer doing business in the US rather in Canada. Yeah. Uh, also, the US has a lot more states that are um, uh, that are easier when it comes to tax laws. For yeah. example, Delaware, you have Vegas, where the tax breaks are a lot yeah. bigger and the tax rates that you have to pay are a lot lower. Yeah. Um, and you can always register a company in Delaware and you can work in California, yada, yeah. yada. So the US has, a, and plus real estate, man. Yeah. Canada, Canada for Toronto, you're going to pay $2 million really? to buy a shithole in Toronto. Mm. I kid you not. You go on YouTube, you're going to laugh. You're buying a property that I can't even pay you to live in yeah. for $2 million. For $2 million in the Florida... You get a mansion yeah. with a full blown pool with a security guard. Yeah, man, it's it's crazy. So hundred percent. Why is it states, so? Why is it so expensive in Canada? Is it demand or something? I or? wish I knew. Um, yeah. A lot of the things that happened after after COVID, uh, interest rates went up. Everybody, everybody, when COVID happened, everybody who was living in apartments, they sold their apartments and went to buy a house. Mm. Uh, then the inflation started taking place. Interest rates went up. People who were paying fifteen hundred dollars in mortgages are now paying three, four thousand dollars, which is a huge, um, a huge increase for people who are, for example, employees who have a budget. 
So that started to create a lot of more demand. People leaving apartments and wanting to go into houses. Mm -hmm. That started to create a very high demand for houses in Canada. And there wasn't as much supply because it's very hard to get building permits in yeah. Canada. So having a lot of demand, not as much supply, that's the one thing that's going to drive prices through the roof. Plus adding to it inflation, interest rates and all of that just made a whole yeah. chaotic um, combination there. Yeah. But uh, US is definitely better for real estate. Dubai is even not too bad. It's expensive, but yeah. capital appreciation here, I think is going to be very good. Um, but yeah. Yeah. So before they kick us out of here, we got like 15 minutes left. I really want, I was really interested. So when you, when you uh, reached out to me and I looked at your profile, I was like, wow, I got to talk to this guy. And the big thing was, uh, so you do sales training and you have courses and you've had about 250,000 people buy your courses. Is that right? On how, Udemy. How does that work? I see, I see you have like maybe 50 courses on there. 70, almost 80 courses. Yeah. You're just teaching all kinds of things, right? Majority of stuff that I teach are related to personal developments. Okay. Um, when I first started in business, my mentor told me success is 80% mindset. Yeah. And I spent about five years literally in the University of Ottawa's library at home, just reading books. I read maybe over a thousand books and I applied so much in terms of personal development and mindset development that I, this became one of my best skills. Before getting into sales and marketing and trading, I didn't want to teach those skills because I'm like, these are the skills that I can capitalize on with my personal clients. Majority of my courses, I focus on personal development, mindset development, neuroplasticity, psychology, stuff that I learned in university and stuff that I learned by myself. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I got my majority of the students. And keep in mind, Udemy, I haven't actively worked on it in about three years. Really? I made my courses, I made my name on the platform, and then every month I just keep getting more students yeah. on the old courses. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of sales, sales, you can't do a course, man. I've done uh, the Jordan Belfort's course. I've done a course for sales by Grant Cardone. We were talking about him earlier. It's not the same. When mm -hmm. you get somebody in person who's training your sales guys, it's a completely different yeah, experience. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, courses were majority of them based on psychology, mindset, um, success mindset, psychology, personal development, productivity, stuff mm -hmm. like that. But that that built pretty massively. So so where's your biggest source of income right now? Is that dis digital marketing or is that these courses? The biggest source of passive income is online courses for sure, yeah. uh, hands down. The biggest source of active income would be digital marketing. Yeah. Working in all crosses, digital marketing lead generation is one of the most profitable things mm -hmm. you can do. And especially expanding now into some clients that I'm talking to in Dubai, uh, even though I don't want to expand into too many clients. But what I noticed is that clients in Dubai are willing to pay a lot more. A lot of partnerships in Canada and a lot of the mentality in Canada is, I don't want to pay until I see results or let's do a partnership. Companies that don't have a lot of money, they're like, okay, uh, how about once we start making money, then we'll pay you. These, mm -hmm. these partnerships are a little bit problematic. Here in Dubai, you don't have these issues. You charge the fee, you charge per lead, and then you start scaling. So let's see where this goes. But for now, it is digital marketing, hoping that it's going to be the brokerage company. Yeah, yeah. What about you? Airbnb right now is the biggest business model. Yeah, it's the only thing I do. <laughs> and everything, everything in Iceland is still up and running, operating. Yeah, yes. Do you have people managing? Yeah, so what I do, obviously, there's a lot of factors you have to do. I have uh, my cleaners. I have a cleaning company. I outsource everything to a cleaning company. And then for communication with the guests, I have virtual assistants in Pakistan that do that. Obviously, that's a lot cheaper than having staff in 100%, Iceland. 100%. So they handle all the communication. And then I have a handyman in uh, all, just on the ground that goes and uh, and handles all the Jeez. issues exactly and they're just all in a whatsapp group they just run it all by themselves i have the group muted and uh the only only time they need something from me they just something urgent. they just tag me and uh I'll, I'll check it out so it runs pretty much automatically the only thing i handle is like the pricing and uh making sure the listings look good, maybe uh, update the photos a little bit, do stuff like that. And uh, that's what I'm building towards here in Dubai. And obviously I want to scale that to a much bigger, bigger thing, not just 30 apartments. I want to get to like, like, a, like a hundred. This is amazing. You know, what you said reminds me of something that I lived by, which is build, delegate, automate, repeat, Yeah. build, Delegate, automate, repeat. And like you that. did that so beautifully <laughs> because you literally now have a team, yeah. people communicating on WhatsApp, all making sure that your business is running smoothly and you only get in touch when there's something urgent that they need. Otherwise, yeah. the business is pretty much hands off. So it's, it is kind of a source of passive income for you at the same time. Yeah. Uh, 
well, it's it's hard to call it passive income, but but you still have because there's audience. always a lot of stress. Like they reach out to me about something like every other day, so it's always some kind of stress. Like this this issue in this apartment, like owners having this problem. We need to like there's always something. So it's hard to call it passive, but it's definitely like just I, I just one of the biggest things I do is just try to minimize the work I have to do. Try to like put some systems in place. Trying to give this person authority authorization to do this to spend this amount of money just try to do everything without trying to bother me just so i can try to grow grow things here do you think you can eventually find a manager that can take care of this part that causes you the daily headache and have it be almost 90 percent passive um i mean i mean i'd say it is 90 percent passive already but uh Perfect. but the 10 percent is just still a, a lot of headache oh, it's not a lot of headache but uh it's but good to have some I, sort of involvement. Yeah, I, I think I'm never going to be able to outsource everything, but I think I'm just always going to get that 1% more, you know, just to the people that are already working, like give them permission to handle this. Maybe eventually I'll give, you know, I won't be handling the pricing anymore myself. I'll give that to somebody else. So I'll just always try to delegate a little more. I have uh, I have a question, but first I wanted to ask you something. Yeah. Um, one of the main issues that we we're talking about problems with Airbnb one issue that I that I thought about is also capital, mm -hmm. because you're doing leases for a year, yeah, right. So you're fronting about a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, maybe a little bit less, seventy thousand mm -hmm. dollars to pay for the full year. Yeah, betting on yourself that you'll be able to recoup yeah. what you spent plus make some profits. Yeah, for a lot of people who want to get into Airbnb businesses, mm -hmm. if they don't have capital, mm -hmm. they can't get into it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's uh, that's an issue I'm gonna be uh, running into pretty soon. That I'm uh, have spent Liquid. spent all my money. Obviously, I I, uh, I have saved up uh, some money, and I have room to uh, get a lot of properties, maybe ten or twenty properties. Uh, so so what I do, so I don't have to pay the entire rent full full year. Three or four payments. Yeah, I put I I look for a landlord that accept four payments. So I just have to. Uh, put out like three months at a time. Perfect. And, uh, but obviously I have to spend a lot on furniture and and then I have to pay the the agent commission. I have to pay 5% security deposit. So there's a lot of money, yeah, that goes into Booking securing fee. each each apartment. But once you have a big portfolio, then it, uh, you know, uh, you start making enough money uh, that will and you can use that money to get the next apartment and etc but in dubai because you can scale so fast uh once i get all my systems right i have 10 or 20 apartments i might be looking for uh an investor or a partner to come into this with me to uh try to to scale scale it faster so i don't have to wait for money to be saved up to get my next apartment and that transitions pretty well into the next topic i want to talk to you about is uh content creation like i recently started making uh some content on instagram and uh i just been posted i posted about eight posts or something but it's crazy how 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 much it changes like i've just posted like eight videos and i get like 30 messages every day just photographers wanting to take photos or interior designers that want want to help me or even investors asking if they can invest yeah so looking at you, like you, you have a YouTube channel. You, you've got it all. You, you've been doing this a long time. Like, what's your content creation journey like? I did not expect content creation to be the way it is. I yeah. created videos on Instagram for about a month. I think I had one video that did very well, got almost like a hundred thousand views. Yeah. And I started getting messages pouring in. Yeah. Um, I noticed that. When I got to that point, I realized that this is not what I was trying to achieve, especially because the videos that I was posting was more uh, little pieces of wisdom, personal development was also not purely related. You do something very niche and specific. Yeah. I was more sharing pieces of wisdom and it just a lot of messages. People want to edit the videos, do this, do that. And I'm like, OK, everybody got it wrong. I'm not trying to do this. I had a few videos recorded with some people. I'm like, it would be fun to upload the, uh, the content on Instagram. I wanted to focus on YouTube. When I uploaded videos on YouTube, I wasn't focused on, oh, I want to grow my channel. I was like, okay, I have some interesting ideas. I want to create a YouTube video about it. Mm -hmm. And it picked up traction. I think I'm at almost 12K on, on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, but my focus was never, 
I want to create content to, and I, I don't think it was yours either. I don't think you created content. You were trying to document your journey. Yeah. And I noticed that it's when people try to document their journey, share their skills, wisdom, information, knowledge, this is where they do the best. Yeah. And it's people who are trying to create content to get views and to get traction are the people who end up quitting after a week because yeah. nobody likes their content. Yeah, so I, I think it's that. I didn't expect to get any views. I thought, of, and I, I just, I, I listened to a lot of Ryan Pineda and yeah. he, he, he like influenced me uh, in a way. But uh, all, all I said to myself is I'm just going to, post 100 posts see what happens because also it's just uh it's such a good like business card your 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 instagram page 100%. just just say i reach out to a landlord and i want to get his property and i'm trying to convince him to sell please his apartment if he can see my instagram page where i've posted like a bunch of videos o o on what i'm doing he's going to be so much more likely to work with me so so even if uh, what i always thought is just even if you're not getting a lot of views even if you're just getting like 500 views per, per video you're just building up your business card so 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 i just think it's so powerful it is it is yeah and uh, eventually hey whatever comes with it we met because of these videos exactly. and you're obviously gonna exactly. have so many business connections because of these videos and these are just pluses that yeah. you get on top of that so yeah exactly i have two questions yeah um something that um the hosts did with me on the last podcast episode which i thought was very nice is Towards the end, they asked me to share two advices, two business advice, and two personal advice. Now, I've already shared mine on the previous podcast episode, and I really want to hear what you would share with people. Okay. Two business advice and two personal life advice. Ah, <sighs> Jesus Christ. Should this be uh, Airbnb related? Whatever right, you let's, like. Let's do Airbnb related for the business ones. So what I would say Airbnb related uh, is just practice your Airbnb skills. You just have to be no. You have to understand how to become profitable in Airbnb. How to make sure guests are happy. How to set up your apartment correctly. Just how to take the photos. How to do pricing. How to delegate. Just you have to just start start slowly and just learn and practice and always don't just be happy with your results. Just always try to make more. Try try to fix things to make more. Try to delegate as much as you can. And uh, the other thing, I don't know, man. I What's your advice for somebody who has capital, yeah. doesn't have as much experience and wants to start this? What would you say? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Yeah, I mean, then, I mean, if you have time, just start with one apartment and, uh, and, and practice. Just start with one apartment, put it on Airbnb, try to get better. Or if you... I mean, if you have capital and, and you don't have time, then just invest in somebody that, that is good good and do this. I invest in somebody like me. I could I could offer somebody to, uh, we would sublease an apartment together. He would bring all the capital and we'd split the profits 50-50. He, he could get into it like that. And you said about personal goals. Two advice for personal. Yeah, life. something we talked about before we came in here was just sales. Just how important sales is and sales is really just being presentable like just uh, like I, I worked in an insurance company for three years and just talking to people every day on the phone try to uh, like advise them to buy the right uh, uh, insurance plan try to uh, influence them into uh, buying a package and just really becoming good at sales I think and being presentable I think that's the biggest biggest thing so people need to get on sales. They yeah. need to learn sales. It's How easy. about you? Give me uh, one advice. Um, the, the personal advice that I shared on the last episode, which I'm going to share again, is people need to believe more in themselves and their abilities. Mm -hmm. I believe that me and you would have achieved what we achieved a lot earlier if we had full blind belief in our ability to do so. And obviously, having full blind belief comes with you learning and practicing and actually becoming a master of your craft. But I believe if more people, I see so many people that have potential men, but they don't believe in themselves. They don't believe that they can make something happen. And it breaks my heart because I'm like, man, you have the potential to do something great. But you stop at, but what if, you know? So that's the personal life advice that I shared before and now that I will share again. And obviously uh, skills. You spoke about sales. I would just say skills in general. Um, I've done so many years of school, but I never finished my university. 
I did two years of civil law. I did three years of marketing. I did a year of psychology, anthropology. Men, nothing that you will learn in that is going to be anywhere near as valuable as one year of learning practical skills. Mm -hmm. One year of learning Airbnb is going to set you so much further ahead in business. If somebody wants to become an engineer or a doctor, that's a different story. But in business, it's all about practical skills, sales, marketing, Airbnb, whatever it is, graphic design. Yeah. That's it. What's your second advice? Uh, second and last advice. Okay. Since, uh, since you're putting me on the spot, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to say just taking risks. I think like everything I've, uh, like ever since I was just young, I've just been super like risk tolerant. I just, I like do calculations and say like, okay, this, this should work. And then I just go, just take risks. And, and just like, if you fail, that's good. Then you just learn something to learn. Yeah. Love it. All right. They're uh, kicking us out. We're done. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for coming. This is a lot of fun. That was amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs>